Hello friends from High Street Methodist. My name is Christian Kuhn and I am the co-founder and a pastor at Urban Village Church in Chicago. And I'm grateful for the invitation to share some thoughts with you and be part of this uh, series where you're exploring uh, how other churches are engaging in evangelism, especially in this very challenging climate around the world. I'm happy to share a little bit of thoughts with you. So the text I'm going to be reading from today and focusing on comes from the Gospel of Mark. This is Mark 4, 35 through 41. Let me read these uh, verses first and then share some thoughts. On that day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And waking up, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Be silent, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? May God's blessing be on the hearing and living out of this word. So many years ago, my family during Thanksgiving went to my wife's aunt and uncle's home. They live in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So that's a town uh, about three hours or so south uh, east of Chicago. And we usually went there every other year to be with my wife's extended family. My uh, aunt or and my wife's aunt and uncle live on this acreage. And if you go behind uh, their house, you can explore all kinds of wooded areas, including a little creek uh, that was uh, behind their home. So I was with my children at the time. They were at the time probably about um, seven and three or so. And so we were walking out to the creek. One thing we didn't realize when we got there, however, was that there was this big tree that was uh, over the creek. And at the end of this tree was this little island in the midst of this stream. And on this island were some of my nieces and nephews, so my children's cousins. And they were playing on this tiny little island. And my kids were looking longingly at it. But then they also figured out that the only way to get to this little island was to walk across this tree in order to get to the little island, which is where their cousins were, which is where all the fun was being had. And so even though the tree was fairly wide, it wasn't you know, going to be an easy journey across in order to get where they wanted to go. So they both looked at me and wondered, now what are we going to do? How are we going to get to where we want to go? So this passage today that I read for you is a really wonderful text and like, Many, I often focused on uh, what's going on in the midst of the storm when I was first reading it. But it was at the beginning of the story this time, as I read through it a few more times, it was the beginning of the story that really caught my attention. All of the action goes on in the midst of the storm. But I want to focus instead on the beginning when it says this, On that day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. I started envisioning the disciples starting to debate amongst themselves when Jesus said this, and maybe one of them made even a to-do list or a check marks, or maybe they started to make a pro and con list of why should we follow Jesus? Why should we go to the other side? Now, when we read this passage, we might think, well, what's the big deal? Jesus is saying, let's go to the other side, but there's a lot of things to weigh here. And I can understand if one of the disciples decided, let's Let's weigh some pros and cons of whether we should follow Jesus this time. So perhaps on one side of this uh, to-do list, one of them said, wrote at the top, the heading says, why we should stay on this side of the Sea of Galilee. Why should we stay? Lots of good reasons why they should stay. First of all, it's what they knew. Scholars, and looking at this pastor, scholars say that the west side of the Sea of Galilee was predominantly a Jewish area. And so in other words, these are our people. We should stay because we know them. We can do a lot more. We can get a lot more done if we stay in what's comfortable, if we stay with the people that we know and the culture, the traditions, everything else. So reason number one, why we should stay, it's what we know. Reason number two, why we should stay, we're successful. 
Jesus spends most of chapter 4 teaching in 4, one, Verse 1, chapter 4, it says this, Again, we began to teach beside the sea. He began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him. Such a very large crowd. So Jesus is teaching. He's having some success. Don't we all, whenever we are preaching or speaking or wanting to gather people, if we have a large crowd, why on earth would we leave that? And then verse 36, it says that they leave the crowd behind. So Jesus is drawing a crowd. An excellent reason to stay. Reason number three, why we should stay on this side of the sea. Now the text doesn't say this, but perhaps there was a change in the atmosphere or they saw lightning in the distance. Maybe the wind was beginning to pick up just a bit. And the fishermen especially, they had to know weather, wouldn't they? And so they sensed there's something changing here. There is a storm coming. So reason number three, why they shouldn't go on the other side. It's going to rain. It's going to uh, lightning and thunder. The winds are going to pick up. So they've got this list here. Three great reasons why we should stay. So now somebody says, all right, well, let's make a part of another list. Why we should go. Why we should follow Jesus. And they may have thought some and wondered, why should we go across the sea to be with Gentiles with no idea of where we're going, whether we'll have any success at all. And then again, we're going to get wet and thrown around. Who in their right mind would do that? Who would want to go to the other side? Maybe one of the disciples asked amongst themselves, who wants to go? And I can imagine there was some silence, a pregnant pause, maybe longer than just a pause. Like internally, they're thinking, who would go? Well, Jesus, of course. So if they have that list, Jesus maybe took it and said, no, I'm just going to fold this up a little bit. We're going to the other side, even though it makes no sense whatsoever. Going to the other side is not easy. So a great windstorm arises. The waves beat into the boat. The disciples are chastised for having no faith. They can't get a handle on who this man is who even sleeps, takes naps during storms, and then immediately and then quiets the waves. And then when they do get to the other side, they are immediately greeted by this. So this is chapter 5, verse 2. It says, And when he had stepped out of the boat, when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. So they don't even get a reprieve. <laughs> as soon as they hit the shore, ministry starts to happen. There's no resting. There's no getting their bearings. There's no putting together a strategic plan. As soon as they land, someone is in need, and Jesus, of course, begins to meet that need. Sometimes, I think we all know, Jesus calls us to go to the other side, and it might feel like a boat ride across a raging sea, or even just a few steps being called to go to the other side. I don't know about you, I felt like I had been to the other side the last two and a half years. We have been living in an area that we know nothing about. In the first few months of the pandemic, I kept reaching out to other colleagues uh, here at Urban Village. We, uh, for those who don't know, we're a multi-site church. So now we have uh, four locations in the city of Chicago and now a new one out in the suburbs. And that's what I had started to work on. So in the summer of 2019, I had started and gone out to the suburb. We were doing a partnership with another United, existing United Methodist Church and I was also trying to start a new community. It's the first time we had ever tried anything like that. And I, January and February of 2020, I just started to feel like, I think we've got it. I think we're on our way. And then of course the pandemic hit. So those first few weeks and months, I'm reaching out to colleagues, church planter colleagues of mine from across the country saying, how do you plant in a pandemic? And there was a collective shrug. Nobody knows how to do ministry in a pandemic. Everything has changed so drastically. So we feel like these last two and a half years, we've been living life on the other side with people that we don't know, with circumstances that we don't understand or have never faced before. And if you're like us, we're not drawing great crowds anymore. Our numbers have gone down, even though initially we reached some new people online and people said, oh, this is the new way we're reaching people online. But those numbers have gone down as well. 
And so we've had to challenge ourselves here at our church in lots of different ways. We keep talking about, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could go back to 2019, early 2020, remember those days? And I don't think that's going to happen. And so we are now living in the other sideness of our society. So we have had to make some hard decisions and to try some new things. So I mentioned that we have four sites in the city and one out in the suburbs. One of those sites that used to work, all of them used to worship on Sunday mornings, but because the numbers went down so much and because people are getting so exhausted, one of our sites has had to close essentially for Sunday morning worship. And we're trying some experiments with that site. So instead of Sunday morning worship, we're trying it every other week, Friday night, coffee house kind of gathering. And you know, sometimes when we talk about trying new things in ministry, we say, oh, we weren't doing this well, but then we try this other thing and that's going so well now and we're reaching people for Jesus. But I wanna be completely honest and transparent with you today. The Friday night coffee shop thing kind of started to go a little bit at the beginning, but now it's not going so great. And we're really looking at what will it mean to permanently close this site? That's what it means to sometimes be on the other side. We have tried new things. We have figured out doing things like hand delivering care packages to hundreds of people in our community, which I know others have done too, but having that somewhat face-to-face, -face, masked face-to-face -face contact with people and trying to get a sense of what that was, that was brand new for us. Instead of meeting inside, exploring God's wonderful creation, figuring out can we worship while we're taking nature hikes, and what does that look like, no matter what the weather. So that experimenting in that way too is going to the other side. As with most everyone else, we're doing online worship, but we're also experimenting with that too. So sometimes doing what we call nap church, where people come online, there's a greeting, and then people literally nap together online for 15 or 20 minutes. Or we have house party church, where we gather together and someone is a DJ, and people are all watching online as well. And sometimes those are interesting and go well, sometimes they flop. We have had to experience the other sideness of listening to others. You know, when we talk about how do we reach people, and so we will say, well, we need to ask them. We need to give surveys. We need to have more Zoom conversations. Like, what is it that you want? And people are saying, well, I think I want this. And so we try to offer what they're asking for, and people still don't show up because I don't think they really know. Again, we are living in this other sideness of our world. We don't know how to feel anymore. Do I want to gather with people or not? Do I feel like church is even part of my faith life anymore? Or can I do something on my own? Who, what kind of God would bring about this kind of pandemic? Is God behind this? These are all big questions that people are beginning to wrestle with in other ways and not in a community of faith. We've had to temper our expectations. So now for the people who are coming back, we have to be careful. In my church planting uh, history, you know, when we have started new sites in our city, we have had to figure out, you know, is go, 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 lots of energy, trying to do all of these things. But people burn out and get tired a lot more easily these days. And so we've had to go a lot more slowly. And we've had all of the things that worked pre-pandemic, they don't work anymore. Things like putting ads on the trains. Nobody's riding the trains anymore. So all of those things that we thought we knew, we have to try and shift new things. And the majority of those new things don't work. That's what it means to be on the other sideness of our world. So even though the disciples and Jesus are confronted by ministry right, right away, I have to believe too that when they were in this new area, there were people who were curious about what Jesus was saying and teaching, fascinated by maybe the healings that he did, but not everybody was going to buy in. And so they had to shift expectations and shift their new ways of doing things because living in and on the other side. That's what we have had to do. Adjust the ways that we do ministry with new ways of trying and failing and experimenting. Adjust our expectations. Things are not going to be the numbers we're not gonna have like we used to for the foreseeable future, if ever. We have to be kind to ourselves and realize not everything that I was able to do before is going to work now. We have to be much more reliant on God and the Holy Spirit to see what might happen in this new way of doing things and what it means to live and be do ministry in the other side. So back to the story I started with. My children are standing there. They look to where they want to go, to that other side. It looks great, but they don't know how 
to get there. And they look at the tree that has fallen down and they know they have to walk across like a balance beam across that tree, but they don't know how to do it. But finally they decided we've got to get to that other side. And so they both have their own ways of doing it. My daughter, the seven year old, she literally lied down on this big trunk and she like a caterpillar inched her way so slowly across that tree until she finally made it to where she wanted to go. That was her own unique way of getting to the other side. It took forever, it seemed like, and it was unique, but it was her way of doing it. My son, the three-year-old, looked at me and he wasn't sure he wanted to go at all. He wasn't gonna follow his sister, that seemed too scary. But I said, how about if I hold your hand? And he agreed to that. So he and I went still very slowly and we slowly walked across that tree together so that we would eventually make it to the other side and to where they were feeling called to be and where there was community and where there was an opportunity to experience the fellowship of their loved ones. There are lots of ways to get to the other side. It might take forever. It might mean trying new things. But I believe, I believe that we are called to do so. Even though it makes no sense to go to those new places and try these new things, this is the reality we're living with now. But I would encourage you to think about however you do it in your context. Think about how Jesus is calling you to make it unique to who you are. Knowing it might take a while, knowing it might look a little funny, but also remembering that your hand will be held in the midst of all of it. And it can take however long it takes, but knowing that you can step by step go to that other side and live out the ministry that Jesus is calling you to, even though it seems different or scary or unique, it's where we're all supposed to go. May you be held in God's embrace. May Jesus extend his hand to you and you take it and you begin to make your way and may you explore new ways of ministry and that you are surrounded by loved ones, both those that you know and new ones that you will meet in the midst of what God has called us to be and do. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you today, friends. May God's blessings and peace be with you.